delay comes as President Trump complains almost daily about voting by mail, claiming without evidence that it is subject to fraud. The man he has chosen to run the U.S. Postal Service, Louis DeJoy, has come under fire both for his cost-cutting measures as well as his business connections to the U.S. mail. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy and Robert Duncan, the head of Postal Service's Board of Governors, are both scheduled to testify before a Senate committee this upcoming Friday. DeJoy is a major Republican donor who contributed more than a million dollars to the Trump campaign. Duncan is the former head of the Republican National Committee. Mr. DeJoy has also agreed to testify before a House committee on Monday. In a letter to the FBI, House Democrats call for a criminal investigation into DeJoy's handling of the Postal Service, noting, quote, there is overwhelming evidence that Postmaster General DeJoy and the Board of Governors have hindered the passage of mail. Over the weekend, protesters gathered outside DeJoy's Greensboro home, calling for him to resign as Postmaster General. While the president has warned against voting by mail, North Carolina's Republican Party urges its members to take advantage of voting by absentee ballot. We strongly support absentee voting. Uh, we actually have mailers that are going out to voters right now, encouraging them to participate in the absentee voting programs. Members of the House are expected to come back to Washington this Saturday to vote on legislation blocking DeJoy's overhaul of the Postal Service and provide $25 billion in additional funding. Democrats complain that DeJoy's cost-cutting measures, such as eliminating overtime for postal workers, undermines the upcoming election. Several reports question whether Mr. DeJoy has a conflict of interest as Postmaster General. His former company, which he still has a financial interest in, has a financial relationship with the Postal Service. Mr. DeJoy says in a statement, quote, I take my ethical obligations seriously and I have done what is necessary to ensure that I am and will remain in compliance with those obligations. In Greensboro, I'm Bill O'Neill, WXII. News. The postmaster's decision comes as 20 state Democratic attorney generals announced plans to file federal lawsuits against the postmaster general. As you can see, the map includes North Carolina. Well, UNC Greensboro began their classes today. The university says despite UNC Chapel Hill moving to remote learning because of COVID clusters on campus, UNCG will continue as planned with no changes to academics or to their housing. Right now, UNCG is operating with a mix of online, in-person and hybrid instruction. Social distancing, face coverings, both required on and off campus. Campus leaders say that they're monitoring the impact of COVID-19 and they will change plans if the conditions worsen. Well, beginning tomorrow, undergraduate classes at UNC Chapel Hill will begin online because of the growing number of coronavirus cases. Graduate, professional and health affairs schools will continue their courses as directed. Students who live on campus can cancel their housing contracts with no penalty. Residents who have hardships such as lack of access to reliable internet access, international students or student athletes will have the option to remain on campus. Some are frustrated. University officials opted to make a change given the state's struggle to contain the virus. UNC was kind of, for lack of a better phrase, a guinea pig for all of this, both nationally and across the state of North Carolina. And you know, when you saw 130 students test positive, that should that should tell the rest of the universities across the system this isn't the best idea, especially given the rise of cases across the state. And since Monday of last week, 130 students and five employees on campus have tested positive for the virus. The university has 954 students and they say they have been tested. 177 are in isolation, 349 are in quarantine, both on and off campus. East Carolina University is monitoring a cluster of COVID-19 cases at a dormitory. That means at least five people in proximity have tested positive. Test cases were discovered in the Gateway Residence Hall. No word on the total number of cases on campus. The school says it's working with the County Health Department on contact tracing. Tomorrow, students at Forsyth Country Day School will return to the classroom for in-person instruction. The private school says they will follow CDC and state health guidelines. Students have to wear masks, complete a health checklist, and get their temperatures checked when they arrive. If COVID's taught us anything, you know, control the controllables, and, and we're, we're being reasonable with the information we have. 
making the best decisions we can with the information we have, and we'll keep doing that on a daily basis. Children in grades 5 through 12 have the option to virtually attend live classes. The school says they will pivot to virtual learning if necessary. Well, North Carolina's daily new coronavirus cases are back to over 1,000. 1,263 more people tested positive just since yesterday. The number of new cases was less than half of that on Monday because of a delay in reporting from one of the commercial testing labs. The state health department told us that those numbers would be included in today's totals. Currently, a little over 1,000 people are in the hospital due to the virus. That's up 46, 46 from yesterday, but more hospitals are now reporting their their date to the state today. According to the Department of Health and Human Services website, there are still enough beds to care for more patients. More than 2,400 people across the state unfortunately have passed away. A juvenile died in a crash following a chase with Forsyth County Sheriff's deputies. The crash happened at the intersection of Patterson Avenue and North Liberty Street around midnight. Deputies say they spotted someone driving erratically in a car without a license plate displayed. When deputies tried pulling that driver over, they say the driver sped off, went off the road and hit a utility pole. One person in that SUV died at the scene. Three other people were hurt. Deputies say they found a stolen gun at the scene. A passenger identified as Jalen Lysels was served a search warrant. A 77-year-old man was hit and killed by a vehicle when crossing the street in Winston-Salem. Police tell us David Clark was trying to cross Glen Avenue just before 9 this morning when the collision happened. He died at the scene. This crash is still under investigation. Clark's death is the 17th traffic fatality this year compared to 11 during the same time period last year. Well, cleanup continues more than a week after an historic 5.1 magnitude earthquake rocked our state. Officials in Sparta say so far there have been more there have been at least 20 tremors, and Justin Schreer joins us with an update on that damage tonight. This is all new at 4 o'clock. And officials now say more than 500 buildings were damaged in the town of Sparta after that historic 5.1 magnitude earthquake hit. You can see some of the damage here. Now that earthquake also toppled over two chimneys here at this home as people continue to try and pick up the pieces and figure out what's next. The town of Sparta is still recovering. And more than a week after an intense earthquake hit, sisters Alice and Mary say the sound of destruction is still fresh in their minds. It sounded like the house was blowing up. Everything was moving, everything was falling, and she was screaming, get out of here, get out of here. But instead of an explosion, the two sisters who had lived inside this home for nearly 55 years, experienced the strongest earthquake to hit this area in more than 100 years. The house was going like this, twisting, and things were dropping, and we were hearing, hearing loud drops, you know, and we knew we had to get out. The quake destroyed their home, making it uninhabitable. Emergency officials say 10 families have been displaced, and the reports of damage are still coming in. As far as the functioning of the building and everything, nothing was that injured. It just has your concern when you see cracks in these gigantic rocks. <laughs> and as geologists and researchers continue to learn more about what happened. These two surfaces used to be one continuous surface. And so we've actually, during the, the quake, you had motion along this break that thrust to this block over that way. The mayor of Sparta is pleading for help. The elderly population here in our community cannot afford to fix their homes because insurance is not going to cover it. Don't forget about Sparta and Allegheny County. As people say, they are counting their blessings tonight and are thankful that no one was killed. It was terrifying to think I might have lost her. And as folks continue to clean up the damage, the sheriff of Allegheny County is asking people if they'd like to volunteer to help with the cleanup to reach out to them. In Allegheny County tonight, Justin Schreer, WXII 12 News. It is day two of the virtual Democratic National Convention. Last night, Democrats took aim at President Trump in the first evening of events. In opening arguments, Democrats said the Biden-Harris ticket can best steer the nation's recovery from the coronavirus crisis and navigate the nation's reckoning with racial injustice. The evening culminated in a sharply pointed critique of President Trump delivered by former First Lady Michelle Obama. Donald Trump is the wrong president for our country. He has 
had more than enough time to prove that he can do the job, but he is clearly in over his head. He cannot meet this moment. President Trump called Michelle Obama's comments divisive. He said that she's over her head and should blame her husband for him being in office. I wouldn't be in the White House except for Barack Obama because they did a bad job, Biden and Obama. Former President Bill Clinton and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are scheduled to speak tonight during day two of the DNC. Jill Biden will headline the evening. You can watch coverage of the DNC tonight at 10 on WXII, followed by WXII 12 News at 11. We turn out to breaking news. Multiple people are hurt following a crash that happened in Davie County. This is a look at the scene on Pine Ridge Road. This is near Highway 601 in Moxville. The call came in around 1.30 this afternoon, and Davie County Communications has not told us how many people were hurt. We will keep you up to date. Well, still to come, he didn't take it seriously until he got COVID-19. The warning this man has for all Americans. Plus, spreading the flu, how you can transmit that virus without coughing or even sneezing. And a little bit later, Cannon Hinton's mother trying to understand why her son's life was taken, what she's saying about a possible motive. We'll be right back. A man in Arizona says he ignored the virus until he got sick. Now he's encouraging other people not to think of the coronavirus as political. Miguel Marquez has his message to America. Ryan Sandstrom, husband and father of four, 
got so sick with the coronavirus. My fear when I was in quarantine is I don't know if I've hugged my wife for the last time, which is really hard to think about. Um, and I was really, really grateful when I got to be with them again. Life's good. Go give him a hug. He's better. He's better. For 17 days, Sandstrom held up in a room in their home. Meals served on paper, trash piled up. When he finally emerged, he hugged the kids. Oh, hi. He hugged his wife and saw. <laughs> it was terrifying to think. There were some times where it was like a five hour stretch where you slept in the middle of the day and I just kept poking my head in in the door like, is he still breathing? Is he still okay? Early on, the Sandstroms took the virus seriously. Then like many Americans, stopped paying close attention when they felt the virus became political. I think my mistake was assuming that just because people had made it political that therefore it was wrong. So what I realized, you know, I, that this is genuine, this is real, this is not some made up thing. The virus attacked Sandstrom's lungs. Every time I would breathe in, it felt like there was an ice pick just stabbing in my lungs. Then it attacked the lining around his heart, swelling it. You thought you were having a heart attack? 100%, yeah. yeah. So I had radiation down my left arm and a little bit of numbness down my left arm. Right. Um, and chest pain. Sandstrom, only 36 years old and healthy, no underlying conditions. He still has lingering health effects from the virus he thinks he gave to his wife, but she suffered only mild symptoms. Why do you think you got so sick? That is the million dollar question. Cases like Ryan's, still a mystery. But yeah, we're seeing it in young, healthy patients and it's setting it off and we're not sure why. Prevention is the best way to treat this. The best way to not worry about it is to not get it. The Sandstroms speaking to us in the hope others will avoid what they suffered. I feel like there are still some that don't believe it's as bad as it can be. I feel like there's some that just blame the politics of it. Um, the virus is real. Um, I'm a healthy guy and it, it really beat me up. A hard lesson. The Sandstroms today, closer, stronger, more alive than ever. All right, we turn now to our forecast. Meteorologist Jacqueline Shear joining us to uh, talk about what's to come after such a beautiful day up to this point. Yeah, you know, it really was so nice out there, but now those clouds are rolling back in and the mountains and the foothills, even a few showers there. The good news is most of this rain won't make it down into the Piedmont. Here's a look at our radar loop from the past three hours here. Not all that bad. We are seeing some heavy downpours in some spots, but they're not lasting long. Here's a look at where we stand throughout our area right now. Temperatures in the mid 80s, dry for the most part, but you see those clouds, they have rolled back into the area spotty, so you're still getting some blue sky. You still could see See some of that sun as we go through the next few hours. But tomorrow, uh, it's an entirely different story. We start off with some clouds and even some showers. And then as we get into the afternoon, that severe storm threat has returned. We have frequent lightning, one of the main threats, heavy rain and flooding, of course. Thankfully, our rivers, creeks and streams have had some time to recover, but we're still watching those flashy spots, those low lying areas of roadways for issues that could develop there. Damaging winds will be a threat ahead of the line of storm storms as well as within any of those thunderstorms, but we're not worried about much more than that. Hail a low threat at this point. Here's a look at the hour by hour forecast for the evening. We're just watching those clouds pop in from time to time with some showers in the foothills and in the mountains. About a 20% chance we'll see anything as we go through the evening into tomorrow morning throughout the Piedmont, throughout the triad. But then as we go into tomorrow, more clouds and by 3 p.m. spotty showers and isolated thunderstorms are likely. We'll continue into the late afternoon, early evening, where it's that same setup where we get those heavy downpours that don't last long, but can cause flooding during that challenging afternoon commute time. As you're headed to bed on Wednesday night, they're winding down, but still some showers out there. And unfortunately, we are back in this pattern where that'll return for Thursday and for Friday and then into part of the weekend. Here's a look at the mountains forecast, though, for tomorrow. Those light shower chances throughout the morning pick up by 3 p.m. up to an 80% chance for showers and storms in the foothills, a similar story there, and as in the Piedmont as well, seeing that 60% by 3 p.m. that stays high through the evening and into the overnight hours. We are also watching the tropics here. This one is a uh, the one that we're watching the most closely because within the next two days, there's an 80% chance now that this becomes a tropical depression.
depression and eventually it becomes a named storm. And there's another wave out there that we're watching here within the next two days, a 30% chance that this is uh, a, becomes a developed storm. But within the next five days, there's a 70% chance. But no threats to the Carolinas at this point. Here's a look at the seven day forecast. Those high rain chances through Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then into Saturday. And then as we end the weekend, we're actually drying out with temperatures approaching the upper 80s. We're going to take a look at that extended forecast, that 8 to 14 day forecast in about a half an hour. But I have to tell you, get used to those warmer temperatures. All right, Jacqueline, thank you so much. We're going to take a look at traffic, a live look at Salem Parkway near Peters Creek in Winston-Salem. Not too much going on just before rush hour. Well, still to come, the flu spreads through cough and sneeze, but a new study says there is another way that you can catch it. And the car industry has been hit hard by this pandemic, but things are starting to look up. The vehicle is helping with that rebound. WXII 12 News is always available on the free WXII 12 app. Stay connected to Brandon Bates on his Facebook page. Well, the flu typically spreads by coughs and sneezes, but some new research suggests that flu viruses may also travel through the air in dust. Scientists from the University of California, Davis, painted a flu virus strain on the fur of guinea pigs that were immune to the pathogen. The animals transmitted the virus to uninfected guinea pigs, despite not carrying it in their respiratory tract. The scientists believe the flu spread in the air through dust particles. 
The auto industry hasn't been immune to struggles during this pandemic, but companies are continuing to roll out new models with hopes that customers will continue coming around. After an awful March and April in the auto industry, when the pandemic forced a sharp decline in new car sales, the sales forecast shows last month new car sales were still down, only off about 4% compared to pre-virus predictions, but down nearly 10% from July 2019. I'm wondering myself, uh why the car sales have actually rebounded as strongly as they have. This happened all over the world, by the way. It's happening in Europe and China as well. And I think there was pent up demand. Trucks and SUVs are on pace to account for nearly 76% of new vehicle sales. In July, customers spent $39.8 billion on new cars. That's down $139 million from this time last year. Up next, mail delays in South Carolina, why the Postal Union says it is not the employee's fault. But first, searching for answers after her son was shot and killed while riding his bike. Why Cannon Hinton's mom says justice has not been served. From WXII 12 News, this is Breaking News. Back with some breaking news. We're told multiple people are hurt following this bad crash in Davie County. Here's what it looks like on Pine Ridge Road near Highway 601 in Moxville. That windshield completely crushed. Doors missing, pieces of that car all over the road. This crash happened around 1.30 this afternoon. Davie County Communications hasn't told us how many people are hurt. Once we find out that information, we'll bring it to you live on air and also online. 
We turn now to more breaking news. Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools is investigating after a student started yelling obscenities and making inappropriate gestures. This happened in a virtual art class. The teacher was able to shut down the Zoom meeting and the district says it happened during a virtual art class at Southeast Middle School. They tell us the student was not a student at the school but was in the district. Discipline leaders will follow district disciplinary guidelines as necessary, and Kernersville police say that they are currently investigating. Well, five-year-old Cannon Hinnant, why was he shot point-blank in the head? His mother says she doesn't know, but what she does know is that this murder was not racially motivated. And as Amy Cutler reports, the mother is now seeking justice for her son. Here's more. It's just it's devastating. <sighs> Bonnie Waddell refers to the last week as a nightmare, one she can't wake up from. I don't understand. I don't, I can't wrap my head around it. Waddell's son Cannon shot in the head while riding his bike. It happened in his own front yard on Archer's Road in Wilson as his two young sisters looked on. Police say a neighbor, 25 year old Darius Sessoms, was behind it. He was my neighbor for years. Um, we always spoke when we seen each other. It was. We never, we never, ever had arguments with each other. Sessoms remains here at the Wilson County Detention Center. He was arrested one day after the shooting in Goldsboro. He's been charged with murder. Justice hasn't been served. Waddell telling me she will ask the district attorney to seek the death penalty in the case. Meantime, her focus is on honoring Cannon's memory. Such a big joy by all life. He was a smiley, happy child. The crime now making national headlines. Waddell grateful for the support she's received from the community across the state and country. A GoFundMe page raising almost $800,000. Still, she stressed, race had nothing to do with it. Cannon was white, Sesame's black. This is not a race issue. This was, I don't even know what it was. Waddell would like to see a playground go up in Cannon's name. There's already a baseball tournament and a road race set up. And there are several ways that the Piedmont Triad plans to honor Cannon. Memorial rides in Winston-Salem and Kernersville, a vigil in Mount Airy happening on Sunday. You can find more information about all three events on our website, WXII12.com. A juvenile died in a crash following a chase with Forsyth County Sheriff's deputies. The crash happened at the intersection of Patterson Avenue and North Liberty Street around midnight. Deputies say they spotted someone driving erratically in an SUV that didn't have a license plate displayed. When deputies tried pulling the driver over, they say the driver sped off, went off the road and hit a utility pole. One passenger inside that SUV died at the scene. Three other people got hurt. Deputies say they found a stolen gun at the scene. A passenger identified as Jalen Lysels was served several search warrants. A 77 year old man was hit and killed by a vehicle while crossing the street in Winston Salem. Police tell us that David Clark was trying to cross Glen Avenue just before nine this morning when the collision happened. He died at the scene. The crash is currently under investigation. Clark's death, by the way, the 17th traffic fatality this year. This is compared to 11 during the same time last year. North Carolina daily new coronavirus cases are back up over 1,000. 1,263 more people have tested positive since yesterday. The number of new cases was less than half of that on Monday because of a delay in reporting from one of the commercial testing labs. The state health department tells us those numbers will are included in today's totals. Currently, a little over 1,000 people are in the hospital fighting this virus. That's up about 46 from yesterday, but more hospitals are reporting their data to the state today. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, there is still plenty of room in hospitals to care for more patients. More than 2,400 people across the state have died from this virus. Well, after months of grim news, new data shows coronavirus's grip on the U.S. might be loosening. But as Whitney Wilde explains, there's still a very long way to go. After months of grim projections, a glimmer of hope. Data shows fewer Americans are testing positive for coronavirus. As of Monday, the U.S. recorded an average of 49,100 new cases per day, down from 65,000 per day in July. However, the heartbreak continues across the country as deaths still hover around 1,000 per day. My dad represents literally tens of thousands of people whose lives have been prematurely cut short 
because of the way that we've handled the coronavirus. Enthusiasm is growing for a rapid test using saliva that creators say it delivers results in three hours. The product could be available in a matter of weeks, although the U.S. Surgeon General warns testing won't eradicate the risk. We need to lean on prevention, and that's making sure everyone's wearing a mask, washing their hands, and watching their distance from others. As researchers race toward a vaccine, experts worry about racial disparities in the research. According to the COVID-19 Prevention Network, people who are Black or Latino compose only roughly 10% of the entire testing pool in clinical trials, despite contracting and dying from the virus at higher rates than other demographics. It's a major trust factor. Um, and they're going to have to reach out and they're going to have to have trusted messengers. In Washington, Whitney Wild, WXII 12 News. And we're also getting a glimpse of one of the U.S. facilities that will participate in a trial for a COVID-19 vaccine. It begins today at JEM Research Institute. This is in Palm Beach County, Florida. The site has 10 exam rooms, several meeting centers and even a separate entrance for patients who might become ill throughout the study. A total of 10 people are taking part in the study and on the first day. It has three parts, including the screening period, the study treatment and the follow up period. The doctor leading it says patients could be followed as long as two years. It's one to see how long immunity lasts, which mm -hmm. is important. Do you need boosters down the road? And two, because you can see if more people get protected as you gather more people. So in time. So hopefully it'll have an answer in the first few months after it stops, but it will go on for two years and the, and the visits get spaced out. Volunteers, by the way, are paid $100 a visit. Postal union officials in South Carolina say mail is being delayed by weeks in Myrtle Beach and the Florence areas, as sorting machines are dismantled throughout that state. Elisa Alonzo talked to postal workers about this slowdown. Mail carriers are racing the clock to complete their routes on time. They have 10 minutes to get the mail on the truck. And if the mail is not loaded on the truck in 10 minutes, then the truck has to leave. They're not giving the truck drivers waste to American Postal Union leaders say some mail in the Grand Strand and PD is delayed by two weeks. This is not the postal employees. The postal employees are doing their job. Union leaders in Greenville say some mail sorting machines were dismantled. They have took machines out. They took four DB machines out. She says they were thrown away without explanation. And this is the craziest thing. We were using those machines. Mm -hmm. So it's, it wasn't just sitting here collecting dust and we're not using it. We're using them. And they took them. So the operation has went up in smoke. A union leader says sorting machines were also thrown away in Columbia. Now they say mail is piling up as November approaches. This is my personal opinion. I think that it's full of pressure. A Kentucky state representative wants to end no knock warrants. That is what led to the death of Brianna Taylor. Taylor was shot and killed by Louisville police in March while officers were executing a warrant for a drug investigation. Her boyfriend fired what he called a warning shot at police and police shot back. No drugs were ever found in Brianna's apartment. Louisville has already banned no knock warrants, but state representative Attica Scott says it needs to go beyond that. You ask that we end home invasions by police, and that's what Brianna's Law for Kentucky does. You might call them no-knock warrants, but they're home invasions. The bill would also mandate alcohol and drug testing after a use of force incident and require police officers to leave their body cameras on while serving search warrants. The legislation will be considered by the General Assembly's next session in January. Well, convicted felon Roger Stone plans to drop his appeal. Stone was convicted last November on seven counts of lying to Congress and witness tampering during his work on the 2016 Trump campaign. His conviction stood even after President Trump commuted his sentence and Stone vowed to try to clear his name in the court system. Prosecutors want Lori Laughlin and her husband, Massimo Giannulli, to get prison time for their roles in the college admission scandal. The couple pleaded guilty to conspiracy charges in the case. The government accused them of paying $500,000 to get their daughters into the University of Southern California as fake crew team recruits. After a few months of prison time, the government is requesting two years of supervised release for both defendants. They'll be sentenced on Friday. 
Changes are coming to the popular Ellen DeGeneres show. It comes after allegations of a toxic work environment at that show. Three of the show's top producers have left, and DeGeneres said an internal investigation has been launched into the allegations. She said, quote, we are taking steps together to correct the issues. President Donald Trump announced that he will pardon Susan B. Anthony, who faced charges in 1872 for trying to vote. It comes on the 100th anniversary since women got the right to vote. The Constitution's 19th Amendment was ratified on August 18th of 1920. The House of Representatives and Senate had approved the amendment the previous year, sending it to the states for ratification. Three-fourths of states had to ratify it, and the last one needed to do so was Tennessee, making it part of the Constitution. Checking traffic out there this evening, here's a live look. Highway 29 and Cone Boulevard in Greensboro. Things look great out there. No backups or crashes for drivers to worry about. Up next, COVID has kept us separated from family and friends for months. But one couple is thanking the pandemic for bringing them together. We'll share their love story. We have a few heavy downpours right now in the mountains. Coming up, we'll talk about if that rain will make it to your neighborhood. Well, major wildfires ravaging parts of California. One Salinas family lost its house to the flames, a place that they never planned to leave. Efrain Ruiz, his wife and two young children made it out safely and they're now staying with family. The hardest part, breaking the news to his three year old daughter. She didn't want to go home and uh, I'm going to have to explain to her that we can't go home because there is no home. I feel like I'm dreaming, like, like I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be in my house. I hope I wake up and 
I'm in my home and this never really happened. Ruiz says what also makes this really difficult to process is that they never planned to move out of this house. They say it was a place that they were hoping to raise and grow their family. Mm. Well, it is never too late to find love. Two 70 year olds in Brooklyn say the pandemic brought them together. Monica Morales shares their love story. First the balloons, Aww. then the ring, Aww. and he sealed the deal with a kiss. 76-year-old Jeffrey Miller popped the question to his true love, 71-year-old Gloria Alexis, on August 6, surrounded by staff and friends where they live here at the Amber Court Assisted Living Facility in Canarsie. Something about it that made me happy. We met the couple Monday, and they are completely smitten. Walk her up. Miller says they have quite a love story. They met at the facility, have been friends for three years. Staff tells us they are inseparable. During the pandemic, Alexis got sick and had complications with her kidneys. Miller said that's when he realized he loved her. I told him, I have a surprise for you. Miller said it was the thought of losing her that was too much to bear. As the world seemed uncertain, one thing became more and more clear to him. Alexis was the love of his life, and he better put a ring on it. I love her. I love her. They can be me. Their message to others looking for love during the pandemic. You're never too old to find love. I'm 76 years old. She's 71. And you're never too old to find love. Never give up. Right. Keep the faith. You always find somebody out there. That was Monica Morales reporting. The couple says they have two big things in common. They love their families and watching TV together. They're planning to get married in September, and they say their family and friends are all invited. Great story. Well, Girl Scouts is serving up some breakfast with a new cookie flavor, introducing Toast Yay. It's a French toast inspired cookie dipped in icing, ready for your breakfast table or lunch box, whatever you want, or a night of watching Netflix. Because of the pandemic, Girl Scouts, though, still plans to sell cookies online. You'll have to wait, though. These cookies won't be available until January. Sounds pretty good, though. Yeah, it does. All right, now turning to our forecast with the Jacqueline Shear. You've been talking about some showers in the mountains. The question is whether that will make its way down into the triad. Yeah, you know, most of it won't at all. If we get anything, it'll be a light shower here or there. But I'll tell you, those clouds are starting to build out there. We got some nice sunshine this morning, and that's starting to go away. We're looking at our radar loop from the past few hours. We're